say, want to know what really happened? My name is Russ Kyle. I give tours, crime tours. tell you a story about San Francisco at the turn of the century. It was a far different place, a dirtier industrial corrupt town. And it was the time of the corrupt regime of Boss Roof, the last big machine politician in San Francisco. This is a corner of Columbus and Kearney. It is now the home offices of the infamous Zoetrope Studios and Francis Ford Coppola's trendy restaurant. But at the turn of the century, it was the Sentinel Building, built by its more infamous owner, Boss Roof. And at the zenith of his power, it was here that Boss Roof controlled San Francisco. Abraham Roof was a Jewish Frenchman who graduated the University of Berkeley at 18 when he became a lawyer and entered the California bar. He decided to go into politics. And you see, the boss and Eugene Schmitz, the mayor of San Francisco, who was a band leader, who ascended to the mayorship because he was the head of the band unions, but he has no previous experience. He's controlled lock, stock, and barrel by the little boss, Boss Roof. So Roof started out a dirty politician, and he remained so. In those days, prostitution and gambling were legal in San Francisco, as was opium, as were a lot of other things, like selling Chinese women out in the open. That was all swept under the rug during the boss's administration. This block of Jackson Street is now Chinatown. But at the turn of the century, it was dominated by one of the most profitable whorehouses in the history of San Francisco. Not any ordinary house of prostitution, the hub of prostitution in San Francisco, owned and operated by Boss Roof and the City Fathers. The municipal crib was a massive myriad of interconnected cubicles that catered to the purient taste of the proletariat. For a moment of bliss, the cost was five dollars. Unfortunately for the poor girls, four ninety-five went to Boss Roof and the corrupt mayor Eugene Schmitz. There were bigger fish to fry, and these big fish were the telephone companies the railway companies that wanted to merge into the municipal railway. There was also PG&E that wanted to control the power for the Bay Area. And Boss Roof was getting graft from everybody. You see those overhead wires that dominate San Francisco's Muni skyline? Boss Roof received graft for putting those in. He also owns 300 acres out in the sunset, all the way to the beach. He owns it all. That's the Parkside Land Company. How do you get to the sunset? You have to drill a tunnel through Twin Peaks. And there's graft involved with the railroad to get that contract, build that tunnel, to sting the voters in San Francisco. One man, the Sugar King's son, Rudolph Spreckles, stuck up for the city of San Francisco. And he hired the legendary detective Burns of the Burns Detective Agency to investigate corruption in San Francisco. And he hired the dogged prosecutor, Francis J. Haney, to prosecute the corruption in San Francisco, and especially Boss Roof and Eugene Schmitz. During the California Gold Rush, Jews flocked to San Francisco to practice their religion in freedom. The Jewish people prospered. The congregation, Sharif Israel, founded in 1850, landed here in 1904 and built this beautiful structure behind me. 
the temple Sharif Israel. And it was here that the infamous, notorious Boss Roof was tried for corruption. It wasn't because Boss Roof was Jewish that they held his prosecution trial here at the Temple Sharif Israel. It was because of the fire and earthquake that had decimated municipal San Francisco. And it was particular graft and corruption that had led to the destruction of the municipal buildings. And that was what Boss Roof was being tried for here at the Temple El Sharif at the historic corner of Webster in California. This beautifully reconstructed Moorish structure has been a lot of things in its history. But 1881 Bush at the turn of the century was the infamous Bush Street Temple. And it was here that Boss Roof tried to solicit the help of the two rabbis in order to get his prosecution overturned because it was spurred on by severe anti-Semitism. Boss Roof and his cronies would descend to any level to get the prosecution to cease and desist from these prosecution trials. In fact, they would line the gallery in the courtroom with thugs, armed thugs, waiting for the prosecutor Haney to go into one of his diatribes. When Morris J. Haas, known Roof bagman, Oswald-like character, rises up at the end of court one day, and shoots Francis J. Haney through the mouth. Haney is laughing at the time, so the bullet passes through his mouth. Haney thought he was struck dead. He said, they prosecuted me because I pursued this prosecution of graft in San Francisco. Haney lived, thankfully, to prosecute again. But the damage was done to Boss Roof. There is no jail, so they hold Boss Roof on Fillmore Street with his good friend, Chief William J. Biggie. Chief Biggie and Boss Roof are corrupt pals. Much like his successor, John Gotti, the Teflon Don, Boss Roof dined sumptuously during his incarceration here. He had his meal sent to him from the St. Francis Hotel. He was allowed to entertain guests and conduct business. And he also played numerous games of whist with his good friend, police chief, Biggie. Suddenly, William Randolph Hearst's examiner becomes the point man for the anti-corruption crusade. Third and Market Street, the home of the Hearst media empire. Media mogul William Randolph Hearst was an avid anti-corruption proponent and had the temerity to print scandalous cartoons with a target emplaced on the prosecutor Haney. Well, when the prosecutor Haney was shot at, irate San Franciscans stormed Hearst's building the examiner and completely trashed it and broke all the windows. Since the days of the Accaldes, San Francisco has had corruption down at City Hall. And just like in Boss Roof's time, today there is corruption at Fulton and Van Ness. Abe Roof was sentenced to seven years in San Quentin. He served six and came out of prison a shell of a man. Ironically, one of the graft busters who engineered his downfall, newspaper man Fremont Older, hired him to write his memoirs. But the little boss, unable to concentrate, never did put pen to paper and faded into obscurity. I got a laugh when I see our current politicos pandering and promising to Frisco's gullibillions these days. They learned well from the little boss who wrote the book on rigging elections. And as long as we've got voting blockheads who only want to be told what they want to hear, politicians will tell them. And as long as we have ex-politicians in the pockets of the money guys, there's always another crime just around the corner.